Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. A Senate committee has greenlit a subpoena as part of Hunter Biden's corruption probe. But some senators say it puts the focus on the wrong issue at a time when the virus is wreaking havoc. Massive floods leave 10,000 people displaced. The flooding is expected to get worse and peak this evening. People are in shelters while a stay-at-home order remains in place. House Democrats are pushing for controversial ballot collecting, but a Republican is looking to cut federal funding, funding to state elections if they allow the practice. A unique demonstration has set up shop in Michigan. Free haircuts on the Capitol lawn protest the state's lockdown order. And the MTA is testing UV lights to see if they can disinfect its trains and stations. A Senate panel today issued a subpoena and its probe of the work that Joe Biden's son did for a Ukrainian natural gas company. It wants to Blue Star Strategies records since 2013 that are related to work for or on behalf of Burisma Holdings, where Hunter Biden sat on the board. The Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee voted on Wednesday to subpoena lobbying firm Blue Star Strategies. The company was a consultant to Burisma Holdings, a Ukrainian gas company that paid Hunter Biden to serve as a board member until he stepped down in 2019. The 8-6 vote followed party lines. The subpoena requests Blue Star Strategies records from 2013 to the present that are related to work for or on behalf of Burisma Holdings or individuals associated with Burisma. The panel's chairman, Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson, is also requesting a meeting with top Blue Star officials. But the Democrats are, are objecting, and I, I think uh, maybe they're protesting too much. It, it actually raises my suspicion level of what is, what is to be found out uh, in these documents. Senate Democrats strongly objected to the decision. Yeah, it makes uh, no sense uh, whatsoever. We're in the midst of a, of a pandemic with uh, over 90,000 people who have lost their, their lives. We've got uh, unprecedented un unemployment uh, sweeping across to the, the, the country. We need they say the panel should concentrate on overseeing the federal response to the pandemic. That has to be our singular focus uh, right now. But Johnson says he wants to release a report on his investigation as soon as next month. The Senate passed legislation today to rein in Chinese companies. It would require those listed on American exchanges to comply with U.S. auditing and reporting standards. It's that or they face exclusion. Chinese companies listed in the U.S. aren't held to the same accounting standards as U.S. companies. U.S. regulations can't examine their audit papers because the Chinese Communist Party considers them state secrets. But the new act would boot them off American exchanges if authorities are unable to inspect their audit books for three years in a row. Fraud and accounting malpractice by Chinese companies listed in the U.S. has cost investors billions of dollars. And Michigan is experiencing record floods. The state is evacuating 10,000 people and putting them into shelters despite an active stay-at-home order. Rapidly rising water has forced the evacuation of about 10,000 people from flooded communities in central Michigan after two dams burst. The governor Wednesday warned that one city could end up under about nine feet of water. Experts are describing this as a 500-year event. It's going to have a major impact on this community and on our state for the time to come. And that's why uh, we are going to be very aggressive about getting help from our federal partners. She says the water will peak at around 8 p.m. local time. Families along the Titabawawasi River and Connected Lakes were ordered to leave home twice in 24 hours. By Wednesday morning, water several feet deep covered streets, parking lots and parkland and had reached a hotel. The river already topped a previous record set during flooding in 1986, and it is expected to crest at about 38 feet. The governor urged people in certain danger areas to evacuate, even as the state is in the midst of a CCP virus stay-at-home order. I want to continue to remind people if you're in an impacted area, please evacuate. Hey, this is going to be hard, but we are anticipating several feet of water across this area. And 
The governor is looking at legal action against those responsible for the dam failures. Area schools were set up as shelters with cots spaced apart to adhere to social distancing guidelines. An unusual sight at Michigan's Capitol lawn today. Hairstylists giving free haircuts to protest the state's lockdown. Michigan's governor says small businesses like salons and barbers may not even be allowed to open next week and some are fed up. Hairstylists can't cut hair at their shops, so they set up on Michigan's Capitol lawn Wednesday. They gave free haircuts in defiance of Governor Whitmer's lockdown. They've been sidelined for months. They've been unable to feed their families, support themselves, pay their mortgages, pay for their cars, and unable to make a living. And the governor has not done anything to allow these people to go back to work. And special support for Barbara Carl, a shop owner whose haircutting license was suspended after he reopened his business. I knew that regardless of what happened, I was standing on the right side of myself and my creator and you. Even at the protest, Hairstylists faced consequences. They were given citations. The state police have been doing their jobs. They've been doing it faithfully. They're good people. They've been given orders from the attorney general to write tickets today to these people. He says they organized Operation Haircut to show support for all service type small businesses like salons, nail shops and massage therapists. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Michigan's governor says because of the nature of the business, salons and spa spas are very unlikely to reopen next week. But bars, restaurants and retailers in Michigan can start letting customers in on Friday. And small businesses in New York City are facing serious financial trouble. Hundreds of entrepreneurs are asking the governor for a timeline of when they can reopen. NTD's Kevin Hogan has more. I have lost about that amount be, being closed. A band of over 280 small businesses are calling on Governor Cuomo to reopen the state and get New York businesses back to work. They claim they helped flatten the curve and now they are pleading to the governor to reopen because their businesses are hurting. It's getting worse by the hour, not even by the day or by the week. Every hour we're afraid of what's going to be. We don't know how to plan for our fall season. We don't know how to plan. We don't have as much assets or as much you know, as, as the big box stores. We're Governor Cuomo has opened seven regions in the state, but Long Island, Mid-Hudson, and New York City remain closed. A coordinator for a small jewelry store is outraged that big box stores that sell food are able to sell non-essential items like flooring and clothing, but small businesses can't. Are we being played? Are we fighting a pandemic? Or are we just being used as pawns to be played with by our politicians? Why is there a double standard? The group's legal counsel says they are proposing opening their stores while complying with the CDC and the medical guidance from the city and state. They want to prevent their families from going on welfare. They want to prevent their businesses from being eliminated. And everyone has a right to make a living. Everyone has a fundamental human right to be able to make a living on his own behalf. An employee at the children's clothing store says since they know their customers personally, they can make appointments with them. That way, they can abide by social distancing rules while they operate. Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York. A Republican lawmaker wants to cut funding to states that allow ballot collecting. Ballot collectors go door to door offering to take voters' completed ballots to submit during an election. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on the controversial practice and one lawmaker's plan to stop it. Jobs away Republican Congressman Rodney Davis has proposed cutting federal election funding to states that allow ballot collecting, also known as ballot harvesting. His bill is a response to the House Democrats' Heroes Act, which would allow the practice in every state amid the pandemic. Ballot collecting would let anyone go door to door, gathering an unlimited number of voting ballots from different people and submit them. It's a controversial practice, and the author of the Constitution study, Paul Engel, said he agrees with Davis that ballot harvesting is a threat to elections. There's no proof that the ballot that gets submitted for counting was submitted by an eligible voter, was not tampered with, was not replaced. It's, it is the perfect storm for uh, election fraud. 
The laws vary state by state, but California allows it, and Congressman Davis points to there being too much room for election tampering. This issue got national attention after a campaign consultant was indicted for allegedly collecting ballots illegally and ultimately tampering with North Carolina's congressional elections in 2018. But Engel said both Davis and the House Democrats are in the wrong because it's illegal for Congress to interfere with a state's election process. There is nothing in the Constitution that grants Congress the authority to do anything with elections. They're, they're not allowed. The only thing they're allowed to do is set an election day, but they're not allowed to interfere with the election process itself. President Trump has said the HEROES Act would be dead on arrival in the Republican majority Senate. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. The Michigan Secretary of State said today that all 7.7 million Michigan voters would get absentee ballot applications before the state primaries and general election. But President Trump threatened to withhold funding to Michigan if it allows it. Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen was sworn in for her second and final term today in a ceremony at Taiwan's presidential palace in Taipei. Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen was sworn in for her second and final term on Wednesday, making her message loud and clear that Taiwan strongly rejects China's claims of sovereignty over the island. Both sides have a duty to find a way to coexist over the long term and prevent the intensification of antagonism and differences. I also expect the leader of the other side, China, to take up equal responsibility to stabilize the long-term development of cross-strait relations together. In her speech at Taipei's presidential palace, Tsai said Taiwan could not accept becoming part of China under its one country, two systems offer, which is supposed to guarantee autonomy. But Tsai called for talks with China so that both sides could coexist. Tsai led Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party to a landslide victory in January, vowing to stand up to China. Recently, Taiwan has also accused China of keeping it out of the World Health Organization. And during her speech, Tsai said Taiwan would continue seeking active participation in international bodies. Over the next four years, we will continue to fight for our participation in international organizations, strengthen mutually beneficial cooperation with our allies, and bolster ties with the United States, Japan, Europe, and other like-minded countries. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo congratulated Tsai on Tuesday, praising her, quote, courage and vision in leading Taiwan's vibrant democracy. The WHO made a grim announcement today. There's a record number of new virus cases worldwide. And France's death count is on the rise again. The WHO said over 100,000 new virus cases were recorded in the past 24 hours. That's the most in a single day since the outbreak began. The total number of worldwide cases is approaching 5 million. French authorities reported 110 new virus deaths on Wednesday. That's a slight increase from the day before. It brings France's death toll to over 28,000, the fourth highest in the world. A powerful cyclone tore into eastern India and Bangladesh on Wednesday. Bangladesh has evacuated 2.4 million people to shelters. In eastern India, 650,000 people have been moved to safety. It's too early to estimate a toll on life or damage to property. And around the world, people and businesses are adapting to the virus. A pub in Tokyo has installed a machine that sprays customers with disinfectant as they enter. In Thailand's capital city of Bangkok, a shopping mall installed foot pedals in their elevators for customers to step on instead of pressing the buttons, lowering the risk of exposure to germs. Up next, troubling scenes in northeastern China have many concerned about a second wave of infections. We bring you the details after the break. Just how is the Chinese Communist Party exploiting poor but resource rich or strategically situated countries using debt trap diplomacy? What role is the U.S. playing in the global response to coronavirus? And how do authoritarian regimes like China have an outsized influence in international organizations like the WHO and the UN Human Rights Council? 
In this episode, we sit down with Bonnie Glick, the Deputy Administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID. She has worked in the Foreign Service at the State Department, in the private sector at IBM, and in the world of development nonprofits as a Senior Vice President at Meridian International Center. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kjellik. Now to northeastern China, where virus outbreaks are raising fears of a second wave. Videos on the ground show troubling scenes. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more. A May 19th video shows 100-meter-long lines outside a hospital in the northeastern Chinese city of Xinjiang. The person taking the video says everyone registered online before coming. He doesn't say if they're waiting for CCP virus testing or they're just feeling unwell and want to see a doctor. Local media did not report on the story. Another video shows people in protective gear at a primary school in Xinjiang. The school is currently closed. And on May 18th, in the same city, two buses arrived at a shopping mall, and people in protective suits got out. It's thought that new cases were found at the shopping mall, so merchants and shoppers there are being tested. One netizen commented, the whole city of Xinjiang has fallen to the virus. Everywhere is locked down. The Communist Party never publishes the true number of confirmed cases, just like it never publishes anything about its own corruption. The northeastern city of Shulan is one of the two high-risk areas in China right now. Nobody is allowed to enter the neighborhoods there. On May 20th, local authorities tightened the control measures again. In nine neighborhoods, residents are not even allowed to walk around outside. Now to Beijing, the most important political event in China, the two sessions, will start there on May 21st. Chinese authorities are requiring all attending journalists to get tested for the CCP virus, also known as the novel coronavirus. There's temperature checks at the entrance. News conferences will be conducted via video links. Diplomats hoping to observe sessions must check into a state guest house the night before and be tested for the CCP virus. One particular case in Shanghai has people worried. A lady from Wuhan tested positive for the virus at a Shanghai hospital on May 19th. She arrived in Shanghai eight days before that and used public transport while she was there. She was tested and came back negative before she left Wuhan, so she was given a green health code. One netizen questioned if the test in Wuhan was inaccurate or if she got infected on the way to Shanghai. Many Chinese people know the authorities are under-reporting the figures. So if one case is officially confirmed, people worry the real situation is likely much worse. The lack of transparency results in anxiety and even panic. After Wuhan's plan to test all 11 million residents in 10 days, Taiwan's Minister of Health said China's epidemic situation is much worse than it says. And he says he's worried it's being covered up again. He adds the CCP wants to resume work smoothly and to stabilize the situation during the World Health Assembly. But he's afraid that they're covering up for a second time. He warned Taiwan should still stay alert at all times because China has a habit of cover-ups. Amid reignited trade tensions between the U.S. and China, the EU's position isn't always clear. Some of its leaders criticize the communist regime, but many try to protect their own economic interests at the same time. Our France correspondent sat down with the director of Paris's Economic Warfare School, who says they're playing a very dangerous game. The Chinese city of Wuhan is not only the origin of the CCP virus, it's also a gateway for French industry. But the global pandemic has forced some French companies to rethink their business dealings with China. French car manufacturer Renault is one of them. It's adjusting its strategy in China by halting part of its production there in April. But other companies plan to continue their cooperation with the Chinese regime. Christian Harbelot, director of Paris's Economic Warfare School, says the health crisis presents a chance for French companies to consider whether or not operating inside China is a good strategic move. These French businesses located in China seem to forget that they're under the rule of a communist dictatorship, which is a criminal regime by nature. The rules that govern international trade were largely shaped by the U.S. and Europe. 
As trade tensions again rise between the U.S. and China, for Europe, doing business with China is also a question of politics. It's still unclear whether the EU will side with the United States and exert its own pressure over the regime. The EU's foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell told French media JDD that the EU shouldn't be naive about China. But he added in another interview that his job is to maintain a good relationship with China. According to Harbulo, this position is a very dangerous one. In a recent report published by the Economic Warfare School, Harbulo stated that because China doesn't have the military means necessary to conquer Europe, it targets the economy instead. China tries to bring down Western countries by stealing their technology and weakening their industries. He says European leaders are now at a crossroad. They can choose to side with U.S. and prevent China from subduing Western countries. Or they can choose to continue this game, where they criticize China while still trying to protect their own economic interests. This choice would be suicide, I think. Reporting by David Vives, NTD News. Coming up, the Labor Department expanded safety inspections of businesses to combat the pandemic. Find out why unions still aren't happy after the break. Ninety percent of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epic Times is to chase the truth, to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit. Subscribe today and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. The U.S. Labor Department will now conduct closer inspections to see if businesses are complying with the CCP virus safety measures. In addition, a virus infection can now be counted as a workplace illness in some cases. The U.S. Department of Labor will expand inspections of CCP virus hazards to include businesses beyond only healthcare facilities. But the policy falls short of demands by worker advocates. The revised policy was issued late Tuesday by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. OSHA is also requiring businesses to record CCP virus infections as workplace illnesses if the employer can determine the infection occurred at work. OSHA has the power to fine employers for violating workplace safety rules, but only after it conducts inspections and investigations. The revised policies stop short of one of the key demands of unions. They want OSHA to adopt an emergency temporary standard for workplace safety regarding the CCP virus. One union even sued OSHA in an effort to force it to implement the standards. OSHA says the lawsuit interferes with the effort it's making to protect workers. One complaint in the lawsuit was that OSHA leaves decisions on the supply and usage of personal protective equipment up to the employers. A standard would impose requirements on businesses and speed up the enforcement process for companies that don't comply. An advocate describes expanded inspections as too soft a solution. In our business briefings, oil prices surge as demand picks up, but Britain's Rolls-Royce is forced to lay off 9,000 as demand for their airplane engines disappears. Global markets made a breakthrough today as investors bet on a rapid recovery from the virus-induced recession. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 369 points, or 1.52 percent, to 24,575. The S&P 500 gained 48.67 points, or 1.67 percent, to 2,971. And the NASDAQ composite added 190 points, or 2.08 percent, to 9,375. Oil prices climbed 3 to 4 percent on signs of improving demand. U.S. oil rose $1.61 to settle at $33.57 a barrel. Senator Amy Klobuchar wants Uber Eats' proposed takeover of Grubhub to be scrutinized. She raised concern over anti-competitive effects that could hurt consumers. 
She says a merger of Uber Eats and Grubhub would combine two of the three largest food delivery application providers and raise serious competition issues. Tesla is dropping its lawsuit against California's Alameda County. CEO Elon Musk wanted to resume production, but the county's lockdown orders prevented it. The carmaker stopped production March 23rd, but resumed operations earlier this month, ignoring the state's orders. Britain's Rolls-Royce says it will cut at least 9,000 jobs from its global staff of 52,000 and could close factories. The company supplies engines for a large aircraft and is paid by airlines based on how many hours they fly. That means its earnings will be hit by the collapse in air travel demand, which is expected to last for years. And coming up, with Europe's streets still mostly empty, wild animal herds are blazing their own trails into major cities. More on that after the break. Following its decision to halt overnight service, New York City's subway system is now making a new move. Over a hundred specialized light, light bulbs are being used to try to kill off the virus. The New York Transit Authority is now using 150 ultraviolet sea lights to test how effective they can be in keeping its system free from virus contamination. The handheld lights, made by Denver-based Puro Lighting, can be carried by workers into stations, staff rooms, cars, and other spaces. The pilot program is part of the MTA's ramped up cleaning efforts to prevent a second wave of new virus cases. Earlier this month, the corporation took the unprecedented step of halting overnight service to clean train cars. The subway system, whose tracks until recently carried 9 million passengers a day, now closes from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. every night for cleaning. And in Europe, with people still at home, animals are starting to explore major cities. Police in Berlin had to briefly block off a road on Sunday when about 30 wild boars made a quick crossing. The boars had tiny newborns with them as they scooted toward and then across the city street. Police parked their cars across the road to safeguard the animals' passage. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in.